Hi, and welcome to the ASN interview series. I'm Joe Glazer, and today I'll be interviewing Jonathan Tabs, digital futurist and co-founder of the Augmented Society Network. Jonathan Tabs is a global leader in marrying storytelling, business strategy, consumer insight, and technology to ideate, manage, and launch solutions that truly deliver. He's had a long career in digital. Uh, he's a professor at Boston University, an international speaker, and advisor to major companies such as Fox, Warner Bros., Disney, and ABC. Hey, Jonathan, it's great to be speaking with you today. Hey, Joe, thanks so much. Feelings mutual. So Digital Futurist, that is a really cool title, I have to say. <laughs> Can you tell us what, what that entails and share a little background uh, about how you got to where you are? It's funny because even hearing Digital Futurist, it's too limiting, I think. Not, not to make me sound any more grandiose, but just the fact that there's so much interactivity between digital and analog. And even with how much further we're getting into technology and devices permeating and sometimes feeling like it's running our lives, without us as the analog or organic element, saying digital is only part of the equation. When you ask, how did I get here? I, I think it really comes up or down to how I started. And, and that's always been uh, as a storyteller. So whether it was lighting design major in college to coming out of college, coming out to Los Angeles, working in the entertainment industry, which is full of storytellers. And so I found my little niche in that and moved into more technical or digital realm, certainly at the end of the 90s, have just parlayed that into looking at what comes, what coming, how do I position myself to deal with that? How do I best benefit those who I'm working with by being able to capture the, the points and connect them together to tell the story. Because, you know, as we know in technology, it's so easy to get hyper-focused on one element, whether it's my relationship with my wife, my dealings in business, my finances, my company's ability to deliver X. But it really is, how can these things interconnect? I'm a firm believer. I make no bones about it with the future that I'm working with others on defining. It's really not absolute. It really is about getting people to think, to see, to feel things differently, to open up their minds to the possibilities of what can be, as opposed to limiting ourselves to what is or where we are now. We're constantly evolving. We're constantly changing. If I was just saying the future is beholden to social networks, that as a futurist means nothing. But if we talk about what that could be in terms of story, in terms of full product, that's where people can start saying, oh, now I get it. Let me see how I can be a part of that movement. That's great. So one of the things I caught on your website was you guys have clients worldwide. You advise companies on the future. And one of the things it talks about is you guys are connectors. And when people think about connectors, they usually think about, oh, uh, a networker, someone who connects people. But it sounds like you're actually connecting ideas. You're connecting the realities of today and sustainable possibilities of tomorrow. That's really interesting. Thanks. I'm glad you read the website. <laughs> uh, we are connectors of people, ideas, opportunities, all those types of things. Not to get too much into what Kaleidico is all about, but Kaleidico on one side is working with companies and helping them set themselves up for future change. And we go off an idea of brand OS. When we're dealing with an operating system, whether it's Apple PC, Android, iOS, whatever, when there's an update, it's not a matter of starting from scratch. Everything just gets updated and you move on and you find other opportunities that didn't exist before. And it's about plugging in those opportunities, right? So you've already got certain data sets and now you can manipulate those data sets in different ways. So we look at our clients, the corporations, the small businesses, the large multinationals as how do you address the change that's required? And that change is not just technology. That change is often as deep as the core of brand, which we see not as the positioning you put out there for people to say, oh, look at that cool ad, or let me buy. It is, how did you build your company? What gets you up in the morning? What is the way you need to support your staff? 
How does your staff need to support you? How do you support your distributors, your vendors? The list goes on and on. What does that workforce look like? What is that mysterious, mythical work-life balance that we talk about? But more precisely, how do you deal with change? How do you move forward? Because change is constant, right? So that's one whole piece over there. On the other side, we are a think tank. We are constantly looking at those future elements, technologies, et cetera, and then putting pieces together of our views of what can be, and then going and speaking all over the world at different conferences, whether it's business, marketing, retail, even medical. Ultimately, what we're dealing with is the confluence of all of these different elements. And in the middle, we're able to work with both the large corporations and we can also offer our workshops that we do that really get into the nuts and bolts of everything that gets us up in the morning and what best sets people up for that inclusive future of society that is mindful, that is thoughtful, that is empathetic. As a company, if you set your values properly, then the byproduct is financial gain. We see too many entities these days that are all about the bottom line profit, and it's a downward spiral. We can't say with any certainty of what the future is, but it sure is a lot of fun trying to connect the dots, connect the opportunities, connect the possibilities to what could be a really strong future. That's great. So it sounds like your group is really taking a more holistic approach to yes. understanding the, the needs and, and the opportunities for these companies. Have you found that the work that you've been doing with, with these companies has inspired you to create the Augmented Society Network? Oh, absolutely. I, th I think that with the Augmented Society Network, we are fellows of the Royal Society of the Arts. There's a longer name, but we'll just go with the RSA. Having the connection to all of them to talk about the things that really matter when we're looking at the future, meaning society, workforce, all these different pieces that really play nicely into what are larger packages and what we're passionate about. So through the RSA, I connected with Zoe Camper. We would put on events both in real places and virtual, usually around the topics that we really are fascinated by, which is future technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics, AR, VR, the list goes on and on and on and on. And from that, there was a lot of interest in having further discussions, deeper discussions. And there was also grumbling about starting these thematic networks within the RSA that you don't have to be a fellow for, it could be anybody. And for us, it was a great opportunity because we had free reign to invite anybody that we wanted to. And what I was hoping to get out of the Augmented Society Network was, for all intents and purposes, a sandbox, a place for different people that have different perspectives on what a future that is augmented by technology means so that we could do a number of things. We could build pieces, whether it's just to prove a simple point or whether it's part of a larger project. Also, just the sharing of ideas. There's so much information out there. There's so much news that we can't capture it all ourselves. And so if we were to have that forum, we haven't developed the site yet that we're hoping for, but in the long term, there will be a site that will be an amalgamation between a social network and a Evernote type thing and communal place that we can all come together and share ideas, build out what that possible augmented future society could be. The thing that I'm really interested in and what, where I think it gives us a leg up in terms of doing the right thing is there's too much being decided about where all of this is heading by entities that have a lot of skin in the game, where you start wondering ethically whether they really have conflicts that preclude them from doing what's best for society. And Zoe and I felt that by really building out this augmented society network, it provides an opportunity to bring all of these inquisitive, smart, thoughtful minds together and start talking about and hopefully setting or helping to set policy, not just in the US, but perhaps around the world. There is no ulterior motives for us to make more money for our company, to win things over for our country, to create superiority over one socioeconomic group or another. And that is something that's truly compelling to me. So what do you think it's going to take? Because isn't there going to be a lot of resistance to trying to involve people outside of that, that uh, 
like you said, the skin in the game group, with all the resistance coming at those people, how much is it going to take for us to actually influence policy? It's interesting you ask that. I wish that I had the full answer. As, as we were saying before, things change. We're dealing with the analog or organic and the fact that we're dealing with people and there is a human nature. Unfortunately, we've got an environment right now that is very much about me, 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 without caring about others, which I'm, I'm saddened by, but I'm not going to sit around and just let that be without trying to have an impact where it's more inclusive, where there's things that are for the betterment of society. Luckily, with the RSA, we do have a lot of people where there is an influence on governments. And I say governments because it's not just US or UK, it's all over the place. And so my hope is that we will get a lot of those policy type folks to join us to help us in that component of how do we really make a difference here? Because we could be in our own echo chamber talking about like, wouldn't this be great if, and da, 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 da. I would really love this to be the entree for us to have a seat at the table because of the connections that the RSA provides to engage in meaningful dialogue and meaningful discourse about what is really needed. I think that when the negative things they're doing comes to light and the people raise their voice about it, oftentimes it's heard. The hope is that it's acted upon, but I think that the more strategically we can raise our voice, again, looking at our future, if we as humanity do not force ourselves to become more human in the face of technology, then there could be some bad ramifications. And we really need to be looking out for each other more than ever. Or maybe it's just the same as ever, but we kid ourselves that, you know, we can go it alone. Uh, if, if anything, we, we see that there's a movement that that's not the case. There is no going it alone that's possible. Those that are trying are, are finding negative consequences. And we haven't seen the end all be all of that. And that's where I think we can hopefully make a difference. And again, it goes back to what's my thing? I'm a storyteller. How can I help informing the stories and utilizing my experience with technology, my experience with people, looking at things as opportunities and looking at things differently so you can see how these pieces that might seem incongruent now, if you do these little tweaks, all of a sudden you've got magic. And I think that as a network of intelligent people, of, again, considerate and thoughtful people, as part of the Augmented Society Network, I think there's no limit to what we can actually achieve. That's great. One of the things that you talk a lot about is storytelling. And what story do you want to tell? What project do you want to jump into within the AS? Where does the rubber meet the road? <laughs> or, do, or does the rubber even need to meet the road <laughs> in order to get forward projection? I'm always reminded of the images that we see as headers on articles about whether we want to call it artificial intelligence or automated phone systems or chatbots or what have you, I just have to laugh whenever they show a robot sort of in a human form with headphones, right? So even the point of saying rubber hitting the road, it's like, as long as we're thinking in those terms, and I'm not, to say, I'm not saying forget history, forget where we are. I think that is absolutely important, imperative in how we find a way forward. I'm just thinking, let's not be so beholden or so constricted by where we are now. Back to your question, we talk about storytelling and connecting the dots. And to me, it's how do you leverage all of these different points of data? What we're really hot on is the connection of artificial intelligence, genetics, and blockchain. And a lot of people look at those three things as completely disparate. You know, yeah, the artificial intelligence sort of plays into blockchain. And what, what the hell does our DNA have to do with any of it? And silly, blockchain's only for cryptocurrency. The reality is, is everybody's looking at blockchain as just cryptocurrency. They're looking at it as this is what it is, not what it could be. And when you break it down to its basics, blockchain is an opportunity for shared data that is not centralized, that has contracts written directly in it. So you are not only limiting who has access to your data, but you're also defining how they can use that and defining what you might get in return. And I don't want to go fully into our dissertation of what that means, but if you start thinking about utilization of blockchain to 
handle the data points that we have. Oh, there's also the data points that we're now getting from DNA. People are doing tests on themselves and they're all limited tests for like a hundred bucks that, you know, to define where in the world your family comes from, to understand what foods you might like or dislike, all those types of things. That's just a small part of your understanding of your entire genome. Once we are utilizing something like artificial intelligence or faster computing, quantum computing, whatever it is, to analyze and look at what the similarities are and what the differences are, then you can start extrapolating. You can start pulling knowledge about yourself. If you stored that on the blockchain and then if some company is hoping to utilize that data, then they come to you and look at your block, you know, may I have access to this information in your blockchain? And you say, sure, you can have it, but it can only be used for these purposes. And you're going to pay me X for that. Maybe it isn't cryptocurrency. It doesn't matter what that format is. But again, it's all about taking all of this data and making it available in ways that we've never been able to before. And it's a much bigger picture than what we see a lot of technologists talking about, where it is AI for AI's sake, DNA for DNA's sake, and blockchain for blockchain's sake. And people say, well, isn't that like Gattaca, where you're giving away all your information to make it available to others? Right now, there's so much of our information that we have no control over that's being traded openly, freely for both the good and the bad. And this is an opportunity for us to look at the big picture, connect all these dots, and bring it together so that we can take control back so that we can be better served by the data that we have. And that completely puts on end the way things are right now, because the way things are right now are really cool, but also extremely limited. And the fact that we're still seeing ads for items that we purchased for our friends, wives, children, husbands, mothers, you name it, Why should I be seeing an ad for that two months after I bought it for somebody that's not even me? But that's how we're not utilizing our system the way we should. Amazon's got its information. Facebook has its amount of information. Everybody's got their own silos of information. And what we really need is an opportunity to put that in a data lake so that you can really piece it all together. Again, we've got to do the hoping that it's not used for nefarious reasons. That's why we add in the blockchain element, the fact that Blockchain can store information in so many different ways, and it has so many different implications. Again, because of the fact that everybody thinks of blockchain as cryptocurrency, they're thinking the big thing of the future is, oh, you'll be able to do audits utilizing blockchain. Oh, I'll be able to pay taxes utilizing blockchain. Oh, I'll be able to pay for something at a store utilizing blockchain. The reality is, is there's so much more to it. Imagine, since nothing is black or white anymore, No matter how much people try to make it black and white, you're either right or you're left, you're rich or you're poor, you're educated or you're not. We know that there's shades of gray. It's just been too hard to leverage those shades of gray before, but utilization of artificial intelligence and blockchain makes that entirely easier. If we're able to suss out all of our DNA information to get to what we work better with, maybe we'll know that our physiology dictates that we do better working from noon till 8 p.m. as opposed to 9 to 5. I believe that when we talk about future workforce, we're not going to be working eight-hour days. 40-hour work week is going to be put in the past partially because of want, but more so because of need. And there's not going to be enough jobs to go around. And so we look then at things like Neuralace, whether Neuralace is going to become a reality. Perhaps there's something similar where when you think about it, if you're in an executive job or you're you're actually leading the charge on a certain project, you're often not able to hand off to somebody else to complete that project, which is much different than manufacturing. Manufacturing, there's processes that are in place. You know your part in it. You clock in, you clock out. There's none of that mind share needed. What if we did have that neural lace component that there's a download effectively of why you made certain choices, right? And you would think that the, that some of this is sort of easy, but we've seen this time and time again in corporations where they have not paid attention institutionally to the issues that have or have not worked and have closed themselves off to the necessary change. The reality is, is that when we look at the future, is that there are so many different ways we can go, but there's so many different ways that we as humanity cut ourselves short. We choose not to look beyond what is put on the plate in front of us. The reality is if we can only get four hours of good workout in any day, 
why are we working eight hour days? Why aren't we working maybe four and a half hours or four hour days? And when we look at the gig economy and how people are working from remote locations, and it just goes on and on and on and on. All these technologies, all these, all these considerations need to be made and we need to be open to it. And not every single opportunity is going to be good for every single human or every single business or every single culture, but at least being open to the fact that they're there and that people can be leaned upon for insight. We've gotten ourselves into such a shut off community. Who do I pay attention to? Who do I trust? Who do I, who do I welcome into my circle? And we, as a society, I think have lost a lot of inspiration because of it. I loved a quote that was attributed to Nipsey Hussle after his passing, where he said, if you are not inspired by somebody in your circle, then that's not a circle, that's a cage. So how can I bring more and more people into my circle that I can be inspired by to do great things? That's really awesome. You know, I was fascinated by what you were talking about, combining these technologies, or I guess drawing connections between these new emerging technologies instead of looking at them as silos. And I started imagining people's data as kind of an organism itself uh, that we don't fully understand yet or know how to wield. And as someone like yourself, a, a thought leader, it's, it's kind of your job to, to weave these stories that help people understand it, help them care enough about what it all means and where it's taking us to actually have an opinion and, ha and care enough about it to influence the major companies and to influence policy. So it's a, a fascinating concept to think of, of, uh, of our data as an organism and, and also to, to look at how there are certain, you know, hot button topics right now. And, and I've talked to you, I've talked to Zoe about these as well. Uh, privacy is, is the big one. Right. Um, I saw that uh, a politician, and, and this was also endorsed by Tim Berners-Lee, the Internet Bill of Rights. So there, there is efforts going forward to try to not only bring awareness, but also influence uh, how things are done in the future. So I'm curious, what particular piece of policy or, or where would you want to focus initially? If, if it wasn't the Internet Bill of Rights and it wasn't privacy, if it was something else, where would you throw your weight behind? First off, just, just with those things, I think some of them are too narrow in their focus and they're too locked in a place and time. So you brought up data, and that's interesting too. As an organism, organisms change, and our very own data changes as we change in our life cycle. Whether it's, you know, we grow up and get married, have kids, don't have kids, get divorced, change jobs, change locales, change, like our data is changing all the time, right? As we learn more and more. And I'm concerned that there's too much policy. There was stuff going through Congress in the United States about laws that were made about VHS tapes that were just automatically prescribed onto our media of today, which, when was the last time, Joe, that you used a VHS tape? Oof. When I tried to, when I tried to uh, <laughs> digitize everything, right. so I'd never have to look at it again. Right, exactly. Do you know that in the UK, legally, if you're a black cab driver, you're supposed to have a bale of hay in your car. So there's all these laws, there's all these things that are looking at the here and now without thinking about where they go to. What is the next iteration? What is the growth pattern? Look, you're not going to get it 100% right. You might not even get it 50% right, but at least you can write things. Even if you were to say, this has to be reevaluated in six years, 10 years, whatever it is. There's got to be mechanisms that are within this policy building that is looking at the full permutation of things, not necessarily nailing them in their entirety so that they're, they're absolutely cut and dried. But again, allowing for that grayscale, considering how this really affects humanity and not just how it affects business. A lot of times everybody talks about future tech in just terms of artificial intelligence, but there is intelligent augmentation. When we're talking about body parts, it used to just be that we had plastic prosthesis, and now we're going to have stuff that our brain can control. What does that mean? Like, just as a completely arbitrary question, what happens if in the United States where you have the right to bear arms, what happens when your prosthetic is an, is an arm on your arm? What's the rule about that? And it's silly, and it certainly seems like things that we've seen in movies before, but these are serious questions that haven't really been answered, whether because people think that they're funny 
or because they don't even want to touch that amendment with the, with the 10 foot pole. There are so many questions that people are pushing off or they're not even thinking to consider because from a business perspective, it doesn't make sense to do it. It's the mea culpa society that we've sort of run into where Zuckerberg really made it famous. I'll make the change and apologize for it later. It doesn't say that I'm going to change it or fix the situation later, but I'll apologize and then hope everybody forgets about it. Yeah, what I really like about what you're saying is that there are these really exciting questions to ask and it's fun to dig into the future and say this looks like it's going to happen what are we going to do about it so i really like how you just you talked about the asn as a sandbox you know because we are just playing with the ideas we're having fun like kids you know and and being creative being imaginative and you know we hope that there's uh some really strong and, and um, uh, you know, there's important merit to come from that. It's not a mistake that I say sandbox and its relationship to kids. Because when we're kids, anything and everything's possible. We don't know what our limitations are. Our limitations are, as a kid, are just whether we can see above a counter or whether we get what we want at that moment because our, our parents are in control of that. But otherwise, like, what are you going to do in your future, Johnny? Well, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a this. You're not like saying, oh, well, I can't be an astronaut because, you know, I'm not really physically fit. So why are we cutting off things before they even start? Because that's what we do as adults. We need to go back to the mindset. I'll call it the educated naivete of what if, why can't we do this? Why isn't that possible? How can we make what we thought impossible to be possible? And that's a mind shift that we have to have as adults, as people that, are, that are, are building these futures, as people that are the first ones to test out these futures, that in reality, we're not the ones that are going to benefit from it. It's the generations that come after us. Like Joe, you and I, as we were looking at mobile devices, as, as we've been growing up, starting with the brick and then sort of moved on to become smaller to the StarTac, you know, that was the flip that it was just a, a nice little feature phone with LED numbers and funky letters. And now we're talking about foldable devices and the fact that you just use a finger. My kids are six and 10. My son is doing stuff completely differently than we did because he's just using a finger. And so those things that we did in education, that because of the fact that the people that are running education now grew up in a certain way, and that's the way you were meant to learn, they're now trying to force that on a, on a part of our society that it doesn't make sense to. But we're trying to force that because it fits into a nice little shell. And I know I'm ranting here, or, or perhaps rambling, but all of these lead to what does the future society look like? Forget augmentation. How do we look at things? Because the cat's out of the bag. We can now find things immediately just by asking Google or Alexa or, or you name it. Everything is at our fingertips. And so how do we leverage that as opposed to limiting ourselves based on what has been? Again, I'm not saying forget what has been because our history, if we don't pay attention to it, absolutely will repeat itself. Even if we do pay attention to it, the gravity brings us to repeating it right? So we've got to constantly be pushing forward and at a heightened level of consideration for our fellow humans, all of society. There's great opportunity, but I say also there's great responsibility. Absolutely. Good stuff, man. This has uh, been an amazing discussion. I, I'm, I'm inspired to sit with you and, and sandbox some ideas for sure. <laughs> Um, let's, do it. let's do it. We are going to let's let's move on uh, and, and actually kind of wrap this up. Um, there's obviously so much more that we can talk about, but the the purpose of these interviews is really to just give people a taste of of who you are, so that they know that they can uh, reach out to you and, and work together on some of these things that you talked about today, and and use you utilize you as a resource. And um, well, one of the things that uh, that we like to do toward the end of these is just to get a little bit more about you aside from what you've talked about today just to get more into you know who is jonathan what do you like to geek out on i love to geek out on communities like fan base communities the arts new perspectives i can lose myself in google as you dig deeper and deeper and sometimes i geek out on the opportunities where you never realized there was one before 
I've been really fortunate being asked to speak all over, having connections with people in parts of the world that I never thought, even though I've been working globally, there's the big cities and the big places, but not the, not the emerging countries. And we've been really fortunate to be working with a lot of emerging markets and the constant challenging yourself, your human nature to put your hand out, to shake somebody's hand or to smile. And I know, you know, a lot of, I know Americans are sometimes made fun of because of our ability to smile, but just being friendly is so disarming to people. And it really brings out, I think, the best in people, as opposed to looking the other way or closing yourself off to those things. And I actually had a piece published in Pakistan, which is from other to brother. Instead of thinking about people as others, which there are organizations, there are political groups, there are there's media that would like you to think of everybody else as an other. If you change that thought to brother, that's what I really geek out on. Like, who can I talk to that I can learn from? Who can I start a relationship with? It's not for want of anything more than just getting to know more about that part of the world or that part of the psyche. It could be somebody that's next door that you've never spoken to or downstairs in your apartment building. It's just taking that step forward to make that change, to, to open, to broaden your horizons. That's, that's what I geek out on. Nice. Well, hey, man, it's been amazing talking to you again. And um, why don't you close out by just letting us, you know, anything else that you want to share uh, or ways people can contact you or anything that you're looking for that the community can support you with. So as I was saying, like, I really, I really enjoy seeing new perspectives, meeting more people bringing more people into the sandbox. Whether you wanted to find out more about me by going to kaleidico.com, K-A-L-E-I-D-O-K-O.com, or uh, LinkedIn, certainly check out augmentedsociety.org. I imagine that you already checked it out if you're hearing this. Please get involved. Please, you know, the, the, in terms of what, I'm hoping to meet different perspectives. I'm hoping to meet people from different industries and work with and collaborate with people with different, from different industries as we look at what does the future of society look like? What, how do we help each other? How do we uplift each other? How do we do the right thing? How do we have empathy? How do, you know, all those things that just, it, it just makes you feel good by doing it, you know, without even thinking about any financial implications. And Joe, I really, I really appreciate questions and, and the opportunity. So thank you. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the inspiration. And I look forward to more conversations in the future. Cool.